I'm going to try to illustrate how we talk to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ and how to lead a soul to Christ. Uh, the truth of the matter is, many people think people just preach to people. But we need to learn to speak to people in conversational tones and how to begin conversations about the Lord Jesus. I think all of us have beginning experiences. But before we begin and talk about this, and I'll use a New Testament and deal with this person, we need to understand how God made this person or how God made you. We have a freedom given to us by the Lord, a liberty of soul that we answer to God for. Every human being knows there's a God. He's conscious of that. And there are two witnesses that tell every human being there is a God. One is the witness of the conscience God put in us, and the other is the witness of creation. And by creation, we know that God exists. We don't know exactly what He's like. And the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to reveal God to us. And if you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. And so when He came to this world... He was born of a virgin, as you have been taught, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, rose from the dead, spent 40 days with his disciples, ascended to heaven. And when he ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to come and indwell believers and to do a work in this world that he explained would be done. And we know that the Holy Spirit is in the world working to reprove or convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, we're all sinners. The righteousness we need is the righteousness of Christ. And the judgment, he said, that the Holy Spirit would reveal is the judgment that's already been, been made as Christ became sin for us. The Bible says, He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So He was judged for our sin. Now, the Holy Spirit's at work in the world working to do those three things. And so we're laboring together with God. The truth of the matter is, I'm not doing this by myself, and you're not doing it by yourself. God is with you. And He's not only with you, aiding you and enabling you, He's also working in the heart of the person to whom we speak, because the Lord desires for that person to know Him. We know that's true because He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God equipped us to make a decision of our own will. So we're not in a discussion with a person about whether we're right and they're wrong. We're just trying to be used of the Lord to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're speaking to people in conversational tones about Jesus Christ and, and who He is. And that is so important, so very important that we understand we're in God's hands. We're being used of the Lord, and we're His witnesses. I've said many times to you that the witness noun comes before the witnessing, the verb. So witness noun, what I am, witness what I do, two different things, same word. But to be able to do the things a witness should do, I need to be a witness of Christ's work in my own life. And I had to be so convinced. I need to be so convinced of what Christ has done for me. I think I'll tell you, my first soul winning experience was with a man who asked me to go with him. I was 18 years old. And he said, uh, I'm going to witness to a man to try to talk to him about trusting Christ as his Savior. Now, you and I need to be convinced that people can come to know the Lord. Why did Jesus Christ say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why, why did he say that? Why did he say that? And what is the gospel? He tells us the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So we're telling his story. We're telling the story of God's Son. So uh, we got in the car together and drove to this man's house, knocked on the door, and uh, my friend Arthur uh, said to the lady who came to the door, I'm here to speak to your husband. He's not home. But she invited us in, and when she invited us in, she said, My son is here. I'm a Christian. My son's not a Christian. 
uh, would you tell him how to know the Lord as his Savior? And so he started witnessing to him, and right in the middle of that, the father came in. And so he asked if I would go outside and finish my conversation with the boy, or his conversation with the boy. And I had been told if I went along, all I had to do was to be the silent partner. That's all I had to do, is to be the silent partner. But it changed. And I said to the young man, salvation is a gift. It's like a Christmas gift. It's all wrapped up, finished, it's yours, but you have to receive it. Now, I've learned a little more since then, but God was dealing with his heart, convicting him, and he wanted to know the Lord as his Savior. And he bowed his head there and asked God to forgive his sin and by faith trusted Christ as his Savior. We went inside and the boy tried to work with his father to trust the Lord Jesus as Savior. Now when I came to Christ as a teenager, a personal soul winner who happened to be the pastor of the church led me to Christ after a youth choir practice on a Wednesday evening. He and the youth director who served as the music and youth director had planned the whole thing to confront me and talk to me about the Lord. And they did. And they explained to me in the simplest way imaginable how to know Christ as Savior and asked me if I would pray. I didn't know exactly how to pray, but they led me in a prayer. I wanted to know the Lord. God had been doing a work in my heart, convicting me that I needed Christ. And so I trusted the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior that night. And I've drawn from my own personal experience all these years when I'm witnessing to people, telling people that you don't have to be in a church service or in some revival meeting or gospel meeting somewhere. Right here, right now, you can ask God to forgive your sin and by faith trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Now you can memorize the scriptures. You can use a gospel track. I have gospel tracks in my pocket I could use. And if I wanted to, I could just go through the gospel track and explain it. I think people sometimes are in a public place when they're witnessing and they quote the scriptures to someone. You never cause a a scene and attract attention to what you're doing. As I said, some people just give a track and leave it at that. We ought to explain to people what's in the track if we have the opportunity to do that. And then we can use the New Testament. I'm going to use the New Testament in just a moment and just go through the verses. and You can write them down if you wish and, and talk about it. And uh, they'll get a little closer with this thing and and more distant and that type of thing. But I I want you to see the response of this person. Now, this young man is a Christian. So we're letting him play the part of a person who who needs to be saved. Now, can a person be saved? Think about your own life. Think about your life and how you came to know Christ as your Savior. That's very important. Uh, what, what you're trying to do is be a faithful witness. A faithful witness. I'm going to give you a definition for this, and I'd like for you to remember it. Uh, the faithful witness is going in the power of God's Holy Spirit, giving a clear presentation of the gospel, and bringing a person to the place of receiving or rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. So you're going... Giving, bringing. Going, giving, bringing. I'll say that again. We're going in the power of God's Holy Spirit. There are preparation things we need to do in our daily walk with God to be be ready to witness at any moment. So we're going in the power of God's Holy Spirit. We're giving a clear presentation of the gospel. And that's not necessarily just mechanically shooting it out. We want to make sure that the person understands what we're talking about. And then drawing the net is actually bringing the person to the place of receiving or rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. There are critical areas in witnessing. The approach is a critical area where we deliberately, with a positive attitude, approach someone with a determination that we're going to talk to them about Jesus Christ, not just the weather or a football game or how nice they may look or how nice their home may be, but we're going to talk to them about how to know Christ as Savior. And the Holy Spirit enables us, and we're keeping in mind, 
the Holy Spirit's working in the life of this person. Then the critical area of turning the conversation. Turning the conversation to spiritual things. I think the direct approach to that is the best way. Instead of just hinting around, oh, you may, you may touch on it with church or whatever, but you're going to get to the question, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you ever asked God to forgive your sin and by faith trusted Christ as your Savior? And you may get many answers. Somebody might say, uh, oh, I pray all the time and ask God to do that. Well, then you've got to explain. You've got to explain that we're born once. And we're, when we're born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3, when we're born again, we don't get born again, then born again, then born again, then born again. Satan's work can be undone, but God's work can never be undone. So you have the approach, which is a critical area. You know, we think, well, I don't want to embarrass anyone. That's not the issue. The real issue is we don't want to be embarrassed ourselves. We don't want to be so identified with the Lord Jesus that someone thinks, uh-oh, that's just one of these narrow-minded, bigoted Christians or something. Some preconceived idea we've got of the thing. Then turning the conversation to spiritual things. That's a deliberate thing. That's what we're out to do. Remember, we're going in the power of God's Holy Spirit, giving a clear presentation of the gospel, and then drawing the net or bringing the person to the place of receiving and rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, when we're finished, I'm going to give you these notes and we'll go over these things about the preparation and all these things. There's a number of things that are found in the 12th chapter of a book I've written called Following Christ and Fishing for Men. And I hope you'll, you've had the book. I hope you'll read the book. But these are just a few notes from that chapter I'll give you when we're finished here and answer any questions. But we're going to get into this and uh, just follow along. Simple. Uh, uh, thousands of people could do better than I do. But I, I know it's my responsibility because I know the Lord Jesus. It's my responsibility to tell others about the Lord Jesus. To have means to owe. Paul said when he wrote to the church in Rome, or Christians in Rome, he said, I am debtor. I'm a debtor. I owe this. I've received Christ as Savior. I have the gospel, so I owe the gospel. Understand that? All right. Now, hey, how are you doing today? Doing very My name's Clarence Sexton. Your name, please? Max. Max. Max, it's great to meet you. Nice, to meet nice you. day we're having. Everything's going great for you, I hope. Yeah, not bad. How about yourself? Real well. Listen, I want to ask you a question. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Are you a Christian? Um, I believe I'm a Christian, yeah. Well, let me ask you, why do you believe you're a Christian? Um, I go to church every once in a while. That's a great thing. I wish everybody went to church. But, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's a good thing to do if it's a church that preaches the Bible. Just like, uh, you know, whatever, whatever people do that's religious may be an outward thing. But God wants to change our hearts and come to live in us. Let me show you something from the Bible just for a moment. This is just a New Testament. But the Bible says, Max, that God loves you. No matter what you've done or who you are, God loves you. No matter what your background is, God loves you. And he gives many statements about that in the Bible, but perhaps the most pronounced statement here is in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that He gave His Son for you. He loves you. But we've all got a problem. I've got a problem. You've got a problem. And the Bible tells us not only does God love us, but He loves us even though we're sinners. We're all sinners. Everybody's sinned. And sin is breaking God's law, disobedience to the Lord. But the greatest sin is the sin of not knowing the Lord Jesus as Savior. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. Now I know that I'm not here alone just with you because I believe God wants me to talk to people about what He's done in my life. And I'm so thankful for what He's done, I want other people to know it. Even though we're, we're sinners, God says there's a payment for that sin. 
Just like we purchase goods and pay for things, you and I sin and we have to pay for it. And the Bible tells us in the same book of Romans, in the 6th chapter and the 23rd verse, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages means payment. You work, you get wages, you know what that means. And the Bible says that the payment for our sin is death. That's death and hell. Separation from God. Now we think one of these days that's going to happen. But the truth is we're separated from God now. Someday all of us are going to die physically. And that's separation from our body. When you die physically, you'll be separated from your body. But spiritual death is separation from God. And there's an eternal death and eternal separation from God. But for those who do not know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior, who are living, walking around breathing, they're separated from God now spiritually. So the Bible says God loves us. The Bible says we're all sinners and our sin has to be paid for. But here's the good news. The Word of God says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth, and the word means demonstrated, God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think of that. Have you heard of Jesus dying on the cross? That's wonderful. And uh, that's the greatest thing that ever happened for mankind when the Lord Jesus came to this earth and lived a sinless life and died on the cross for us. He owed no sin debt. He didn't have to pay for sin. So He was able to pay for your sin and my sin. That awful debt He paid. Let's imagine this little testament is my sin. And this is my life. All my sin, all my sin is on me. This hand, my life, this little testament, my sin, it's all on me. All of it. But when Jesus came, let's say this is Jesus. He has no sin on him. When Jesus came, he took our sins on himself. He died for us. He paid your sin debt and my sin debt. He was buried and he rose from the dead. Now let me ask you something. Do you believe that God loves you? I do. Or do you believe that you're a sinner? I do. Well, we're all sinners, aren't we? Yes. Do you believe your sin has to be paid for? Yes. And do you believe that Jesus Christ, God's Son, paid your sin debt? He's the only one who could and he did it. Do you believe that? Yes. Well, that means you believe all those things, but it still doesn't make you a Christian. Just like, for example, this chair supports my weight. But it doesn't support my weight unless I trust it to support my weight. So if you believe that God loves you and you believe that we're all sinners and you believe that our sin must be paid for and you believe that Christ paid for our sin, that He died on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead, we must personally pray. We still have to personally pray and invite the Lord Jesus in our life as our personal Savior. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, in the same book I'm reading from here, in the 10th chapter of Romans, and the 13th verse, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I happen to believe something. I believe that I'm not doing this alone, as I said earlier, that God is also working in your heart as He works in my heart because the Lord has that kind of concern and interest to you beyond anything you could ever imagine or I could ever imagine. The Bible even tells us that He loves us with an everlasting love. And in my own life, someone explained to me what I've explained to you. And I knew that I was a person separated from God because of my sin. I thought I was a pretty good guy. I was just a teenager. And uh, I knew about the Lord, and I believed that He loved me. I believed I was a sinner. And I believed, when they told me, explained it to me, I believed my sin had to be paid for. And I had the idea that someday I'd meet God. I mean, everybody dies, they're going to meet God. And all the good things I did would be put on one side, all the bad things on another side, and I'd have more good. If I got behind, I was going to catch up somewhere. I'd have more good than I had bad. But they explained to me that we're not saved that way. We don't come to the Lord that way. That no matter how much good we do, we can't earn salvation. 
What did you have to do to earn it? Well, we're sinners and our sin separates us. That's why Jesus came and bled and died and paid the price that a just holy God demanded for our sin. And he died for us. And he was buried and rose from the dead. So thankfully he rose from the dead by that hope of the resurrection that we'll have. And when they explained this to me, they asked me if I would pray. Now, I was embarrassed, Max, because I didn't know exactly how to pray in front of them. But they led me in a prayer. And I asked God to forgive my sin. And I trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. And just like the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's Word. God's never going to lie to us. I want you to take God at His Word. If you know God loves you and you know that you're a sinner and you know your sin has to be paid for and you know the payment of your sin is death and hell and Jesus Christ paid that sin debt, I want you this day, this day, to ask God to forgive your sin and invite Jesus Christ in your life as your Savior. Let's bow in prayer. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask you to pray. Let's just bow our heads and pray, may we? Our Father, I thank you for this day and for the opportunity to talk to Max about you. I thank you, Lord, for how kind he's been to listen. And I pray right now that he'll call on you for salvation. They'll ask you to forgive his sin and by faith trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. Max, while our heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, if you'll pray from your heart and ask God to forgive your sin and be your Savior and invite Jesus Christ into your life, I want you to do that. You can pray. You may have already prayed this way just now, but I can lead you in a prayer. Would you pray this to God? Just pray in a soft voice to the Lord from your heart. Dear Lord God, Dear Lord God I, know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. If I die without Christ, if I, die without Christ I will not go to heaven. I will not go to heaven. I want to know you, Jesus, as my Savior. I want to know you, Jesus, as my Savior. Forgive my sin. Forgive my sin. Come into my life. Come into my life. I trust you now. I trust you now. Repenting of my sin. Repenting of my sin. I trust you to come into my life. I trust you to come into my life. And be my savior. And be my savior. And help me live for you. And help me live for you. From this day forward. From this day forward. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now listen to the first verse I read to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, you're part of whosoever, that you believe in Him and you're trusting Him. Well, then He said, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, never go to hell, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. That everlasting life doesn't, believe, it doesn't begin when we get to heaven. It begins the moment we come to know Christ as Savior. So if you've invited Him in your life and He promised to hear your prayer and come to live in your life, then He gives you everlasting life. Now, I can't assure you of that. I can't give you that assurance. I'm going to tell you what God's Word says. But God will give you the assurance if you've trusted Him as your Savior. There'll be a witness within you. He comes to live in you. There was a man who came to Jesus one night when it was dark and inquired about these things, about eternal life. And Jesus said to that man, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. And this was a very religious man. And he said, you mean I have to go the second time into my mother's womb and come out again? And this is a grown man, a ruler of Jewish people. And Jesus explained to him, no, there's a physical birth, there's a spiritual birth. But you must be born again. Now you've had a physical birth, that's obvious. And God calls this a spiritual birth. When Christ comes to live in us, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us and to guide us as we yield our lives to Him. Now there are things God wants you to do with your life. There are things that He wants you to become as a Christian. And He'll help you with all of that. There's so many things I'd like to help you with. I've written some things to help you with and I'm going to leave some things here to help you with. And uh, I want to pray with you. And I want you to thank the Lord today. You thank the Lord today that He heard your prayer. 
when you call on Him for salvation. Let's pray together. Now, don't be frightened about this if you just say, Thank you, Lord. Whatever's on your heart, Father, help Max as he begins to live this Christian life. Now, Max, you thank the Lord, would you please? Thank you, Lord, for, for saving me and giving me eternal life. Thank you so much. And Father, I do thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, look, you say, is it always that easy? Well, not everyone is ready, as ready as Max is. But I was that easy. A child could have led me to Christ because God had plowed up my heart. I mean by that, I recognized that I was lost and needed the Lord. Only God knew what my future held. I was from a broken home, raised by my mother, a younger brother, two younger sisters. Tried to be a good boy but I absolutely knew nothing about being born again. And these Christian men in this church felt like God had given them responsibility because the Lord put me in their path. How many people has God put in your path? Then also we're to seek out people, to seek out. Jesus said to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, you can talk about this. I use this way to teach people. Would you put your hand like this, please? Got it? All right? Hold your thumb like this. God loves all people. Let's say it together. God loves all people. And uh, that's a fact, or let's call it the skeleton. And we need to put verses with that. John 3.16. Let's get this pointing finger. Hold this pointing finger. It's pointing finger. All right? Not only does God love all people, He loves you. All men are sinners. Let's do that together. All men are sinners. That means I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. You want a verse? Romans 3.23, For all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. And there are other verses we can use. Let's keep it simple. You can build on it later and use illustrations like I did putting my New Testament on my hand, that type of thing. Now, the longest finger. Would you hold the longest finger? Here, sin must be paid for. Let's say it together. Sin must be paid for. And the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. All right, let's get the ring finger. The good news is Christ paid for our sin. Let's say it together. Christ paid for our sin. That's good news. And you explain the cross, how the sinless Son of God paid our sin debt. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5.8. But you can believe all of that and still not be a Christian. And there are many people who do believe all that and not Christians because we must personally trust the Lord, come to a time of our own repentance and faith in Christ. I, I don't know exactly how to explain that to, to anyone. I know how to state it. I think sometimes we make a mistake giving people false assurance and saying, now you're saved. No, now you've taken God at His word. People can profess faith in Christ. But the Lord Jesus, by the work of His Spirit, has to give people assurance. And uh, I struggled through that. But I came to full assurance that I met what God said in His Word I was to do to come to know Christ as Savior. Now, there's some people who fuss about soul winners because they say, well, I don't want to push anybody. You know, I believe God will take care of that if they're supposed to be saved. Now, wait just a minute then why did the Lord say go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Why are we personally responsible to get the gospel out? I, I've studied this for nearly 50 years. Nearly 50 years. And I've come to the absolute solid conviction that it's our responsibility to give the gospel to people. To tell the story of Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection. To explain the way of salvation, the way of salvation in Christ and Christ alone. And we can lead people in a prayer. We're not praying for them and they're not praying to us. But many times we don't need to do that. They'll pray. Would you ask God to forgive your sin and trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And there are people who complain about certain words like trust and, and uh, that type of thing. And there's not enough emphasis, they say, on repentance. Well, 
Are we going to make repentance a work? Are we? When God says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You see, someone says, well, I didn't repent of all my sin. Well, I don't think anyone remembers all their sin. But they know they've rejected Jesus to this point in time and they've not trusted the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. That's the issue we're dealing with. God will bring things to mind. Well, what about this process, people say, that a person must go through about conviction? Some people go through that. I remember saying to a, a very strong Bible teacher one day that I came to know the Lord as my Savior the very first time anyone ever witnessed to me. And he said, I find that hard to believe. I find that very hard to believe. But it's true that happened. And I'm very grateful for it. Very grateful for what God done for me. That the Lord Jesus came to live in my life. And as I gave Him control, I haven't always done that, but as I yielded control to Him, He's guided my life and my thinking. Now, I'm just a poor witness. I understand that. But I am a witness of His amazing grace and His saving work in my life. And I want to do the best job I can do to be that witness and God helping me. Now, there are lots of questions you may have. So now what's to become of him? Well, we can show him from the scripture that he's to identify himself with the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And there are people who have different opinions about this, but I believe he should obey the Lord in believer's baptism once he trusts Christ as Savior. And Satan didn't keep me from coming to him. The devil didn't keep him from praying and asking God to forgive his sin and by faith trusting Christ as Savior. And then I ought to ask him, are you going to let Satan keep you from being obedient to Christ in every area of your life and now obeying him in believer's baptism? And he's going to say, no. Then I'm going to explain to him how he, how he can be baptized and identify himself with the Lord Jesus and a local assembly of believers. How baptism is biblically done when you have the right candidate, right person, a saved person, and the right mode in the water, underneath the water, up out of the water. It pictures our death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the right authority, a local assembly of believers. And so there are many things to learn beyond this, of course. But how many of you know Christ as your Savior? Would you raise your hand? Then you ought to be witnessing because you're already a witness of His grace in your life. So, I want you to look at the little piece of paper you were given there. Would you please, and the notes on that. And uh, you can share mine. How's that? All right? Very good. This is just a few little notes for you to think and meditate upon. It comes, as I said, from the 12th chapter of the book I've written on following Christ and fishing for men. And the whole thesis of that book is if we're following Christ, we will fish for men. If we're not following Christ, that's the reason we're not fishing. So there's a little introduction here, and then there's preparation. Know for sure you have eternal life. Know the way of salvation and carry a New Testament. Give attention to your appearance. I want to be ready to be a, a faithful witness at any moment. Uh, for instance, that's not just the way I look, but... Let's go to a restaurant. I'm going to try to witness to the waitress or the waiter. If I'm rude to that person, my gospel witness is nullified. If I'm showing lots of displeasure with things, I'm not going to earn the opportunity to be a witness. There's realization. We realize that men are lost all about us. We realize that someone told you about the Savior. We realize that men without Christ are lost and going to hell. We realize Christ can and will save. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out, he said. And we realize that God will use you to win souls. I couldn't imagine that God could use me to be a gospel witness. I just couldn't imagine it. But he has. He did. He continues. And then visitation. 
Go with a purpose. Go two by two. And of course, you'll do more witnessing and winning people to the Lord through confrontations with people that are not planned, unplanned things that, in public places. That's why we learn to turn those conversations, as I said earlier, to spiritual matters, confront a person about knowing Christ as Savior. And you may have to follow up the, the additional question. Let me ask you this question. You can proceed like that. Let me ask you this question. One, that puts you on the spot. What are you going to ask? And then you're going to have to ask the question. Let me ask you. Then you're going to have to ask the question. All right? When confronting people with their need of Christ, remember these things. Begin the conversation casually. Discern the person's true spiritual condition. People must hear the gospel. So it's not just about come to church or whatever. We've got to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you learn to talk about Him in conversational terms. How He came. He lived a sinless life. He bled and died. He was buried. rose from the dead. You see? And so stay on the subject of salvation. Show the person that he's a sinner. Refer to yourself as a sinner. Show him the wage of sin. Explain to him that Christ paid our sin debt. Review the main points. And try to do this. And go as long as God keeps that door open. Show him that he must receive Christ by faith. State, let's have a prayer. And you begin there. We had a wonderful young fellow come to church the other evening and want to stay after church and talk to me. And uh, I'm, I'm always ready for that. And I enjoyed it so much. And uh, he'd heard about our church, watched us on YouTube, plays an organ in a church that is a totally different kind of church from our church. Not a gospel preaching church, not a Bible preaching church. So I said to this young man when I got his name after we talked a while, I said, let me ask you something. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Are you a Christian? Have you been saved? And he said, you know, uh, I was employed as a camp counselor by a Baptist church. Went to the camp to lead the kids. But as I listened, I'm the one who got saved. I trusted Christ as my Savior. And he gave a clear testimony of his salvation. Now his experience was not like mine in the sense of the surroundings and circumstances, but his experience was exactly like mine and every other person who's ever come to Christ. Repenting of their sin and putting their faith in Christ and His finished work for salvation. We all come the same way. But I wanted to discern his spiritual condition because he was impressed with things here and music and he said nice things about the preaching and all of that. But I wanted to know, does he know the Lord Jesus as Savior? Because when I was asked, are you a Christian? I told the man who asked me, yes, I am. But he pressed the matter further to understand that I was thinking coming to church, having a Bible, believing in God made me a Christian. <laughs> People say atheism is the biggest problem we face. No, religion without Christ. Religion without Christ. Whatever religion it is, if it's without Christ and salvation, that's the biggest issue we face. Then the invitation, that's a very delicate matter. God will lead us. I'm not going to push somebody beyond what they are willing to do. I want to be kind about it. Jesus knocks at the door. They have to open the door. Then explanation, we ought to explain to people what's happened. Give them a good Bible verse to hold on to. Leave some gospel literature. I can leave with this man, this gospel tract, because it was written the same way I present the gospel with those five things that can hold your hand. As a matter of fact, I, I was doing it. I don't know if you saw me, but while I was talking to Max, I was doing this. Because if I get off track, I know if I'm on this finger where I am. I know if I'm on this finger, I know where I am. You see what I mean? And so the, the person to whom I'm speaking has no idea what I'm doing there, but I, I, I'm talking about the love of God. I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about the payment of sin. I'm talking about Christ paying our sin debt. And this little finger, you know, smallest on all of them, but most important thing here, we must personally pray and receive Christ by faith as Savior. Well, the track is written the same way, so you can use the track for the same example. So I would say to him, I want you to read this. This will help you understand more about what you've done today. Or I would say to him, now here's a gospel book that God so loved the world. This is a testimony of my salvation. I just want you to have it. 
or I could give him a full-length book that I've written on this subject. But I, by all means, we'll get his information, his name, his contact information. I'll contact him. I'll follow it up. I'll try to get him in church. If he's in another area, if he's not in uh, contact with, with a church there, I'll try to make contact with the church. If he can't possibly get to our church, then I will work on that. Um, if he can get to our church, our church is organized so that the reaching part of it and the teaching part of it, look please, is joined together. So if I meet someone who's a child, I have a child's class to teach them. If I reach someone's a teenager, I have a teenage class that's specifically designed not only for that teenager, that age teenager from that area. Or a single adult, or a young couple, or an older couple, or a man, a grown man, a grown woman. You see what I mean? So the reaching and teaching is all work together there. Then manifestation, he should manifest the Christian life. I'll explain to him. Now, you need to tell somebody what the Lord's done for you and what you ask God to do for you today. Who's somebody you love, really love? My wife. I want you to tell your wife, as soon as you see her, what the Lord's done for you. And show her from this little piece of literature. He may not know what a tract is. I didn't either. You know, I still think it's a little confusing. Some people don't have this. What is a tract? You know, why do we say that? So anyway... Sure, from this little piece of literature, what the, what the Lord's done for you and what, what you've asked Him to do for you. And uh, you may be the person who can tell her about the Lord and give her clarity about knowing Christ as her Savior. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Amen.